Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And I hope we're going to find this out, but I sort of end with some disappointment for all of you that I don't really make good on some of the claims of what I was trying to do. But I guess I want to leave you with a message that all of this is going to be, be hard. But let me start with um, a story. So I was teaching a writing workshop at a week-long conference in Utah. And as I was flying to Utah, on the plane, I was sitting with another one of the faculty members for the conference. So we're chatting together as we get ready to go off and teach for a week. And she's quizzing me on what we think the most common problems in manuscripts are going to be. So she says, what do you think the most common problem is that we're going to see in beginnings? Anyone want to guess? I said the answer she thought was correct. Too much backstory. Too much telling about the characters. Most common problem with middles, she quizzed me. I said, not enough conflict. And then she said, most common problem with endings. And I said, didacticism. And she agreed that that was correct. So by didacticism, I mean a kind of preachiness, a kind of teachiness, a desire to impart a lesson, a moral, a message to children. And didacticism has been sort of a vexed issue for the field of children's literature because it's so much of how children's literature began with Sunday school tracks and very, very heavy moralized stories and so much of what, in many ways, we've tried to move beyond. Ever since Alice in Wonderland fell down that rabbit hole, we've tried to shake things up where we can write for children to entertain them rather than to teach them. So this is the point I'm starting at for my talk, to raise some problems about didacticism. And then I'm going to try to respond to those problems and suggest some reasons why didacticism in its place can be a valuable thing. But first, to go on with my critique of didacticism, there's a famous adage that's often given to writers. If you want to send a message, call Western Union. This is kind of a dated thing. This is like when there used to be telegrams that would come to your house. But don't try to tell a message through your stories. One thing I like to read every year when the Horn Book issue comes in the summer with the ALA awards, the Newberry and the Caldecott, I love to read the acceptance speeches because I'm fascinated with author's process and what they have to say about it. So this is from Lewis Sacker, who wrote Holes. Any of you fans of Holes? Astonishing book. Here's what Lewis Sacker says about didacticism in children's books. It's hard to imagine anyone asking the author of an adult novel what morals or lessons he or she was trying to teach the reader. But there's a perception that if you write for young people, then the book should be a lesson of some sort, a learning experience, a step towards something else. And he quotes from a letter he received from a kid saying, your book taught me that the acts of your great-great-grandfather can affect your life. And Lewis Sacker said, well, I didn't write the book for the purpose of teaching kids that something their great-great-grandparents did long ago might have cursed them and their descendants for eternity. <laughs> he said if he had any lesson he was trying to teach kids in holes, it was that reading is fun. So, to distill some of the arguments against didacticism, I, there's three that I want us to consider. First is that children just aren't going to read didactic books, that there aren't enough spoonfuls of sugar or saccharin to make the bitter medicine of moralizing go down. John Rowe Townsend is one scholar who has defended this position. He says, the first danger is an obvious one that the child opts out of the whole procedure and reads comics or nothing. And he says, um, gleefully, today nearly all the old didactic books are dead. The survivors are those that rejected didacticism with the addition of a few, such as Little Women, which transcended it. And his novel contribution to the discussion is to say that nowadays what we've done, he says, is just kind of switch up our didacticism. We have what he calls didacticism in modern dress. We're no longer trying to tell children you know, that they should um, convert to Christianity to save their souls, as we see in a text like Elsie Dinsmore. Instead, we're now trying to tell children to save the earth, or racism is bad, or prejudice is you know, a terrible thing. He says, but we're still moralizing in the same kind of heavy-handed way. And he says, the book that no child will read cannot survive, at least as a children's book, nor does it deserve to. 
So that's the first argument against didactic children's books. A second one is that even if children will read these books, the messages are going to backfire. And my favorite example here is from my favorite philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who wrote one of the greatest works on the philosophy of education in the history of ideas, his um, text, A Meal. And in it, he has a very funny scene where Emile's tutor is trying to teach him a moral lesson through using La Fontaine's fable, The Fox and the Crow. And some of you may have come across this fable in your reading. In this story, the crow is standing on a branch holding a nice plump cheese in his mouth, and the fox happens along. And the fox has his eye on that cheese. And so he says, oh, Monsieur Crow, your plumage is so beautiful. What lovely feathers you have. I wonder if your song is as beautiful, if your voice is as beautiful as your appearance. And the crow, oh, opens his mouth to sing and show off his fine voice. What happens? The cheese falls out, and the fox snatches it up. And so it's supposed to be a cautionary tale about being gullible and susceptible to flattery. But Rousseau says that none of this works on kids. When kids read this, rather than thinking, oh, I better not fall for flattery, they think, oh, I better start flattering people to, to get what I want. He said um, that we're teaching children that there are people who lie and flatter for gain, that this is one strategy of advancing in the world. And he said, children laugh at the crow, but they all like the fox. And so what have we done? We've just given them moral lessons that actually are immoral lessons. We're teaching children to act badly in the guise of trying to teach them to act well. And I think that this applies to some recent children's books, too. There's a, a certain kind of book that I'm thinking about that works very hard to teach children not to be prejudiced in certain ways. And I think sometimes these books actually introduce the very prejudice itself. And so I'm thinking of, um, an author I greatly admire is Andrew Clements. His book, Frindle, is brilliant. But he has this book, The Janitor's Bo um, Boy, that always has bothered me. Because in the book, the kid's father is a janitor. And he's mercilessly teased for being um, a janitor's son. And his friends all say, you know, nice overalls your dad has. And is he giving you lessons on how to mop up vomit? And there's all these very. Um, the stream of insults about janitors. And finally, at the, and the boy is sick with humiliation that he's the janitor's son. And finally, um, he does something to sabotage his father's work because he's furious that his father's a janitor. And then finally, at the end, he comes to understand that his father is a great guy and that it's valuable work that the janitor does. Well, and maybe I'm deluding myself about this, but I thought when my kids were in elementary school, their custodian, and they didn't even use the word janitor, was this really, really cool woman who could fix anything. And she had a big tool belt. And the kids adored her. She was the heart and soul of the school. And I'm thinking, are they going to read this book and learn to not make fun of, of janitors? Or are they going to read this book and say, oh, we thought that she was this real cool lady. But I guess there's something shameful about her position. Oh, but now we're going to learn that it isn't really shameful. So there can be this, this problematic um, dynamic here. So, so now we have two arguments on the table, that didact no one's going to read didactic books and that their messages are going to backfire. But I think the problem with these first two arguments is that they are actually empirically false. Kids do read didactic books. Consider the Berenstein Bears series. There's 300 books in the series with 260 million copies sold in 23 languages. And here's some of the titles. The Berenstein Bears and the Messy Room. The Berenstein Bears and Too Much TV. The Berenstein Bears Say Please and Thank You. The Berenstein Bears and the Wrong Crowd. The Berenstein Bears Hurry to Help. So I mean, these books are clearly read. And I think that children often do take these moral messages to heart. I grew up with Highlights that has that column, Goofus and Gallant. It's a co comic where Goofus is always doing the, the naughty thing, and Gallant is doing the correct thing. So in one issue, Goofus leaves the water running, while Gallant is shown turning off the outside faucet. Goofus expects his dad to go get him a napkin from the table. And Gallant says, I'll get us some more water. Well, Kids write in letters to highlights, and they say things like, I felt like Goofus when I didn't listen to our mom and the dog got loose. 
I felt like gallant when I wrote thank you cards for my birthday all on my own. So I think there's, that the two, first two arguments may not hold up. But here's a third one. Didacticism just leads to books that are bad. That, that we, they're books that are of inferior literary and aesthetic quality. So C.S. Lewis has this wonderful essay, Three Ways on Writing for Children. And he says that um, he's very worried about the project of figuring out what moral lesson kids need and then dutifully imparting it to them. He says, I will not say that a good story for children could never be written by someone in the Ministry of Education, but I should lay very long odds against it. So didacticism makes bad books. But now I want to push back against this. And maybe it's partly because of my background, as you heard in the introduction, of being a philosophy professor. Because I find when I read a book, whether for children or adults, I am reading to try to figure out something about the nature of human experience mm -hmm. that the character learns and that I can learn. I love reading for that epiphany moment, where the character finally gets it, where there's been something that's that, that she's been missing some important piece of information that's going to make her life go better. I love that moment where a philosophical truth is distilled for the reader. To me, I always know what's going to happen. I can tell you right now what's going to happen to all of you. You're going to die someday. Like, what's going to happen in the meantime, and what does it, why does it matter? Like, so that's very important to me. And thinking back again to the Newberry speeches that that I mentioned liking to read. Another fabulous Newberry text from the early 1990s is The Giver by Lois Lowry. And if you read her speech, she's clear that she's writing with a clear moral objective. She says, if I've learned anything, and The Giver is this dystopian society where everybody has to be exactly the same, that no one can see color, nobody, because that might lead to distinctions among people, there's this premium placed on homogeneity, uniformity, sterility. She says, if I've learned anything, it's that we can't live in a walled world, in an only us, only now world, where we're all the same and feel safe. We'd have to sacrifice too much. The richness of color would disappear. Feelings for other humans would no longer be necessary. Choice would be obsolete. So a clear defense here of telling a story to impart a message. So the question can't be, should we do this or should we not do this, but how? And here's where I'm going to try to generate some tentative um, preachy pronouncements about how to write for readers without making preachy pronouncements. And then I'm going to go on sort of to problematize all of them. So here, here are just some guidelines. And, and you can think about, as I talk about books you've read and whether you think books file follow these or violate them. So for first is advice that comes from the short story writer and playwright Anton Chekhov. He tells us as writers, pose a morally charged question, but don't answer it. So that the, if we're going to have a story that has moral import for young readers, and he's not a writer for children, he's a writer for adults, but for, or for any readers, pose an interesting moral question but don't answer it. So you can have stories that have a character placed in a very difficult moral situation, a, a ethical dilemma, where the character has to make some very painful, wrenching choice. And as a reader, you're not even sure what choice is, is the right one here. And using philosophical lingo, the classic way these stories are structured is that you have a choice between what philosophers call consequentialism, where you're just trying to do what brings about the best consequences and get the best results, and what philosophers call deontology, where you're going to try to follow moral rules and carry out your moral duties. And these can conflict. And my favorite example here of a classic text for children where they do is the Newbery Medal winning novel Shiloh by Phyllis Reynolds Naylor. It's a classic story of a boy who loves a dog. So the boy loves the dog. The dog is owned by somebody else. And the other owner, the owner of the dog, is abusive to the dog. The dog is chained up, lives without any love. Um, he says, the guy says, my name for my dogs is, you know, get out, damn it, and scram. And so and um, Marty names this dog Shiloh. And he loves Shiloh, and he wants to save Shiloh. So that's going to involve essentially dog-napping Shiloh, hiding him, 
so that he will never be discovered by the abusive owner. And then, you know, trying to make Shiloh his own dog. And you can really feel the pull of both sides of this moral quandary because it's terrible for a dog to be abused. But for Marty to save the dog, Marty has to lie, Marty has to steal. And you could think, oh, those are just rules, who cares? But in Phyllis Naylor's book, these rules matter in that when you start to lie, what happens is that you erode the whole fabric of trust that keeps families and communities together. His, his mother finds out and that he's hiding Shiloh, and he gets her to agree to promise she won't tell his father. So now she's lying to her husband, and, and so this is taking a toll on their marriage. Marty says something later on in the book to his dad, and his father says, you're saying it, don't make it true. And so, so there's real costs here. It's a wrenching story. So this is an example where the book's going to wrestle with an important moral question, but not answer it. But it's going to really give us both sides. But, but here's why we can't put too much weight on this. Not all moral questions have two sides. What's the other side to the claim that slavery was a moral abomination? What's the other side to the claim that, Holocaust, that the Holocaust was a moral atrocity? What's the other side to the claim that racist, sexist, religious, ethnic, homophobic, and ableist prejudice is wrong? Sometimes there aren't two sides. And children's books can be an eloquent moral witness to the right and the good. So they don't have to leave moral questions unanswered. A second try here is to let the message or moral grow organically out of the story rather than shaping the story, rather than um, being imposed upon it by the author. This is very common advice that I hear at writing conferences. <laughs> Just write a good story and then see what, what moral emerges. Quoting C.S. Lewis again, he says, let the pictures tell you their own moral, but if they don't show you a moral, don't put any in. But it's hard for me to believe that Lewis himself was surprised when his Chronicles of Narnia turned out to be a Christian allegory. You know, <laughs> Lois Lowry intended the giver to focus on the value of difference. So I think the most we can say here is that maybe we don't want readers to feel that the author forced her story into a certain form to deliver a certain conclusion, but that a book comes out of a heartfelt desire to communicate something right and good and true doesn't seem in itself um, a mark against it. My next try is the one that I um, am most drawn to myself. And it also comes from, from C.S. Lewis, but he rejects this himself in the essay on three ways of writing for children. But I'm very drawn to it. He says, don't ask what moral the child needs. Ask, what moral do I need? He says, um, we can be sure that what does not concern us deeply will not deeply interest our readers, whatever their age. So I think there's something to this answer to, to my question about how to teach without teaching. Try to teach something that's deep and interesting and surprising to the reader and to the writer, rather than something that's an obvious moral platitude. So to be, you know, I was asked to review this series of books, picture books recently, that are to me an example of doing it wrong. And the Berenstein Bears would have served in the same way. This is the Marvelous Manners series. And some of the titles are The Pirate Who Said Please, Princesses love to share, and cowboys can be kind. So say please, you know, share, be kind. These are not um, startling messages that we're imparting to children. And probably all of you have already gotten the idea that you're supposed to say please, and you're supposed to share, and you're supposed to be kind. And I can't resist saying you also don't want to impart your message in very bad rhyme that fails to scan. Here's an example from this. His pirate ship is a scary sight, the terror of the living room. But he remembered to say, hey, mom, please may I borrow the chair and the broom? Is that good rhyme? No. So, and then also, as I'm sort of beating up on, on this poor little very preachy series, make sure the message you impart is actually true. These books come with parents' notes that say, um, this is for the pirate who said please. It tells parents, emphasize that people will treat you the way you treat them. For example, if you're polite to other people, they will be polite to you. Was this true? <laughs> or cowboys can be kind. 
the protagonist is um, led to reform his nasty ways when another bully is nasty to him in turn, so he can learn what it feels like to be a victim. But is it true that bullies learn not to be bullies by being bullied themselves? What does this teach children or parents about how to respond to a child with problematic behavior? But now I want to turn to some um, examples of epiphany moments in books, lessons in books that are deep and true and wise, where as a reader, I said, wow, when I read these. I have two um, favorite examples here, The Great Gilly Hopkins by Katherine Patterson. In the book, Gilly is a foster child who has this yearning to reconnect with her biological mother. She's put in a foster home with this foster mother, Trotter, and it's the first time in her life Gilly's actually had a loving home, and yet she proceeds to do everything in her power to sabotage it because she has this empty dream of reconnecting with her, with her mom. And at the end, and Katherine Patterson does this on the last page, Gilly's on the phone talking to Trotter about, because now she, she's no longer with Trotter and how things have worked out for her. And, and she's very distressed, and Trotter says, life ain't supposed to be nothing, except maybe tough. And Gilly says, if life's so bad, how come you're so happy? And Trotter says, did I say bad? I said it was tough. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful moment. Life is tough, but that doesn't mean it's bad. Life is hard, but that doesn't mean it's terrible. So I mean, I read that and I think like, this is something I need to learn every day in my own life, that I can have really hard problems I wrestle with, but that doesn't mean that my, that my life is bad. And here is a very complex pair of lessons imparted in Liar and Spy. It's a recent novel by Rebecca Stead, who won the Newbery a few years ago for um, When You Reach Me. So this is, it's a, about a seventh grader named Georges, and he's named after the pointillist painter Georges Seurat. And his mother tells him that they have a Seurat poster in their living room. She says, my mother says, our Seurat poster reminds her to look at the big picture. Like when it hurts to think about selling the house, she tells herself how that bad feeling is just one dot in the giant Seurat picture of our lives. I think that's a pretty deep insight, to look at your life from a distance and see the big picture and how a lot of these things are just dots on the canvas. But then, in the same book, Georges is being bullied at school. And when his father discovers this, Georges makes light of it. He says, he talks about Surat again. He says, the little things don't matter in the long run. And his dad says, but they matter now, Georges. What Dallas and Carter, the bullies, are doing is happening now, and you can't just wait for it to be over. We have to do something about it now. And Georges reflects, it's weird, because I know mom is right about the big picture, but dad is right too. Life is really just a bunch of nows, one after the other. The dots matter. OK, so here we're given two deep truths, and we're not even told how to reconcile them. And I thought of the line from physicist Niels Bohr. He said, the opposite of a correct statement is a false statement. But the opposite of a profound truth may well be another profound truth. So two profound truths here. And so I think that's a very powerful moment in fiction for young people. In my own books as a writer, I can't say I've ever come up with anything I think is as profound as what I just read from The Great Gilly Hopkins and from Liar and Spy. But I always try to, to deliver a message that I think is interesting myself. So in my recent book, Zero Tolerance, it's a book about a seventh grader who's always been a good girl, never in trouble, actually a kind of self-righteous, smug girl. One day she comes to school, opens her lunch in the cafeteria. She's brought the wrong lunch by mistake. It's her mother's lunch. No big deal, except it is. Because in that lunch is an apple and a knife to cut the apple. And knives are not allowed in public schools. Sierra always does the right thing. She turns the knife in instantly to the office. She is now facing mandatory expulsion because her school has a zero tolerance policy for drugs and weapons. I based this book on an actual newspaper story um, about an event that took place in a school near where I live in Boulder. OK, so I knew I wanted to write about this, but there's certain lessons that would be too easy here, I think. Like, here's one. These policies are terrible. They are inflexible, rigid, and ridiculous. So I could have tried to frame my book 
primarily as a denunciation of these kind of policies. But I think that would be, first of all, too easy. And second of all, it's not really a kid-like kind of issue. That would be writing a book for an audience of adult administrators to try to get a, a clue about how to run their schools. So instead, I got fascinated by how this would affect Sierra, the girl involved, how it might alter her whole sense of herself as a very privileged child who's never been in trouble to realize how you can get in trouble for something so innocent, how it's going to reorient her whole worldview, and also how do you respond then? Her mother just wants to yank Sierra out of public school and put her in an alternative school for the arts. Her father's an attorney, and he wants to fight this to the, you know, death, and he wants to take on that principle and utterly destroy him, to squish him like a bug. And Sierra has to wrestle with some questions here about how do you respond to massive injustice in the world in a way that doesn't make you act as rigidly and inflexibly as the way in which you've been treated. So well, I have a, another book I can mention, but I think I want to leave time for questions. So I want to just move on with some of my other um, thoughts here. And I have two more little bits of advice to writers about um, how to avoid the wrong kind of didacticism. And then I'm going to move on to showing, to giving an example of a book that I think violates most of this, but is still brilliant and amazing. So <coughs> the, to just round out my account, it seems as if children's books are stronger when the main character discovers whatever this lesson is, this message or moral, when the character discovers it herself. When it's not part of a neat little lecture <laughs> delivered to her by an adult authority, but it's hard-won wisdom, that it's something that she struggled with and wrestled with and figured out herself. But even as I say that, note that in Liar and Spy, the book I was praising a few minutes ago, both of those Surat lessons are delivered to Georges by his parents. It's his mother who says, this is just a little dot in the big picture of her, our lives. And it's his father who says, the dots matter. So just n note that. And also, there's the writing adage, show, don't tell, which is excellent writing advice generally. But I think it's particularly apt when we're thinking about moralizing for children. If you sort of label the epiphany moment, and then Sally learned that you know, she should be kind, then Sally learned that she should say, please, it takes an already deadly moral lesson, if we're using those, and makes it even deadlier. So sometimes um, you, can, you can just present the character learning this without signaling it with any kind of fanfare. And sometimes you don't even have to say it. You can just let the character, we can see how the character has been changed through what she has experienced. And I think I sort of do that in, in Zero Tolerance. So I'm going to sum up my do's and don'ts, and then I'm going to introduce this book that I think um, doesn't, that violates most of my commandments, but is still fabulous. OK, pose a question, but don't answer it. Let the moral emerge from the story, rather than structuring the story deliberately to reveal it. Present a moral or message that's rich and interesting enough to resonate with adults as well as with children. Let the main character discover it herself. Don't herald the presentation of the moral with a fanfare of telling language. And then just for completeness, make sure the moral is actually true and don't deliver it in truly atrocious rhyme. <laughs> but I do think that there are books that violate these and are none the worse for doing so. And I'm going to give you an my favorite example. This book violates most of my commandments except the moral's true and there's no bad rhyme and the character discovers it for herself. But the book gives a ringing question to the answer posed. The story is clearly structured to focus on its central issue and wring a definitive moral lesson from it. The lesson is extremely simple and familiar to almost any adult reader. And it's labeled in as clear a moment of narrative fanfare as I've ever seen. But I think it's one of the most beautiful books ever offered to children. And it is The Hundred Dresses by Eleanor Estes. And I don't know if any of you read it as children. A Newbery Honor book published in the 1940s. It's the story of Wanda Petronsky, who's a Polish girl from a, a poor neighborhood, who comes to school every day in the same clean but shabby dress. And two girls um, 
Peggy and Maddie get involved in this game of teasing Wanda because Wanda keeps making the claim that although she wears the same dress to school every day, at home she has a hundred dresses hanging in her closet. Peggy's the ringleader here. Peggy's the popular, confident girl. She loves to say, Wanda, tell us more about your hundred dresses. You know, and Wanda will say, in this sort of dull pain voice, she'll start giving some descriptions of the dresses and you know, Peggy's half giggling because it's so obvious that Wanda's lying. If she has all these dresses, why is she wearing the same one every day? And Maddie feels terrible about it. Maddie hates that they're playing this game with Wanda, but she doesn't know what to do because if she stands up to Peggy, Peggy might turn on her next and she wears some of Peggy's hand-me-down clothes. So it's a very interesting um, moral, morally charged situation because Peggy doesn't know what they're doing is wrong. Peggy thinks, well, why is she telling all these lies? And why does she even have a name like that? That's one of Peggy's enlightened moral um, comments, Petronsky. And, but Maddie knows it's wrong, but she does nothing about it. And then um, Wanda moves away. But on the day she moves away, the girls come to school, and there's been this art contest. Boys have to draw pictures. This is all very gendered, 1940s. Boys have to draw pictures of cars, and girls have to draw pictures of dresses. And when they get to the school, there are the pictures of the 100 dresses, Wanda's beautiful, shimmering, exquisite pictures of these dresses. So she was telling the truth all along in a way that neither Peggy nor Maddie understood. And they try to go back to her house and tell her that they were wrong and she's gone forever. And her father sends a letter to the school saying, we've moved to the city where people won't tease us for our name and for being poor. And that there's no way the girls can ever really make it right again. And then we get to Maddie's moment of epiphany. At Lat and my boys, when they were little, I would read this to them and they would hate it because I'd cry. It's really disgusting when your mother cries when she's reading out loud to you, but I'm gonna try not to. <laughs> At last, Maddie sat up in bed and pressed her forehead tight in her hands and really thought. This was the hardest thinking she had ever done. After a long, long time, she reached an important conclusion. She was never going to stand by and, do, and say nothing again. If she ever heard anybody picking on someone because they were funny looking or because they had strange names, she'd speak up, even if it meant losing Peggy's friendship. She had no way of making things right with Wanda, but from now on she would never make anybody else so unhappy again. Well, for me that is a huge wow moment in literature. I think this works as a very, very powerful moral message for kids. And I, I'm still trying to you know, figure out why, and maybe you can help me in, in the Q&A. She does come to the realization herself after the hardest thinking she's ever done. And also, although there's no complexity in that message, that message that you should not be a bystander, that you have to stand up and intervene when someone is being persecuted, there's a lot of nuance in the rest of the story. So it's not a, and Peggy herself is not demonized. Although she's the ringleader, she's not demonized. I am here in Connecticut this week because I'm doing research on Eleanor Estes at the um, special collections at University of Connecticut. And so I've been reading her papers and, and her correspondence. And in one letter, Eleanor Estes is saying why she refuses to allow a certain script for a staged, theatrical presentation of The Hundred Dresses, and she says, why has Mr. Kingsley, the playwright, so completely distorted the personality of Peggy? She's a quite usual leader type of little girl, really an admirable girl, who happens in the particular instance of the teasing of Wanda to be on the wrong tack. Why didn't Mr. Kingsley, Kingsley stick to her truly likable personality? So there's layers here. Like, we, we learn this lesson about you can't be a bystander, you have to stand up. But we also learn that a bully and a ringleader can be not a terrible person, just someone who's very deeply wrong in this instance. And then there's so much else going on in the story. There's, there's the hundred dresses and the magic of that moment when they're revealed. So these are all things that we take away from the book, not just that powerful message about standing up against the victimization of somebody because of poverty and ethnicity, but we remember the dresses too. So maybe in the end my do's and don'ts of didacticism have come to naught, 
I want to end by quoting Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the poet, who says, what comes from the heart goes from the heart. So maybe we just need somehow to write books that come from our heart, and yet there are very many bad books that have come from very many good hearts. So I think all I've tried to do here is to say that we don't need to be afraid of deliberately and consciously trying to share our heart's most deeply held truths with children through stories. Thank you. So you, you don't know whether you beat people over the head with it or whether you were so subtle they didn't even get it. And the only way I know to, to answer that question for me is to have someone else read it. And sometimes, I, I, including editors or writing groups or, or friends, because sometimes I, I'll think that I was heavy handed and people will say, I don't get what this is about. <coughs> I think you're kidding. I thought it was so obvious. And sometimes it's the opposite where they tell me, we got it, Claudia, we got it. You didn't need to rub our faces in it. So I don't really know of an exercise, but feedback helps a lot there. Yes, Sam. In just thinking about particularly this year's Newbery and Caldecott award-winning books and thinking about the philosophical issues that are embedded in the Kwame Alexander's The Crossover, C.C. Bell's El Defo, Jackie Woodson's Brown Girl Dreaming, as well as Be Beagle and an Unimaginary Friend or Sam and Dave Dig a Hole, or I'm not going to go through the, there were too many, there are a lot of Caldecott, so I won't go. But it seems to me that there are actually right now more philosophical issues embedded in different ways, possibly didactically, possibly not didactically, in children's literature that is getting recognized than there was in the past. And it could possibly be, because I'm percolating over the liar and spy, because there's so many philosophical issues embedded in that Rebecca Stead book, mm -hmm. even as far as the title goes, the whole what is true? What is truth? Yeah. Am and I like imagining this? No, or? no. I think we're maybe more sensitive to them now, but I think they're they're always been there. I think what's of those I've read, El Defo and Crossover and Brown Girl Dreaming. I know Brown Girl Dreaming the best, and I think there though a lot of what I think of as philosophical truths in the book are kind of very subtle, like they're sort of under. It's more the whole book adds up to the idea that you can live in a place that's deeply racist like the South as an African-American girl, and yet it can have this compelling hold on you because it's a place you love with a rhythm of life you love and with the people you love. And so that there's this complexity to your loyalty to a place that can be a very problematic place for you because of these issues of racial justice, but it can also be a very dear and beautiful place to you because of other features of the culture. So there's that kind of complexity. And, and the same th thing with her family. Um, oh, and, and because it's a memoir, she, has, she raises questions about what's true. And she even talks about her birth, where her mother, her father, everyone present has a different account of her birth. And so, she's, and so that's an early poem that's it's a memoir told in poetry, for those of you who don't know it. And it stands up questions for us about, well, what is true in memoir? And wh whoever knows the truth, and to have some sort of caution as you speak the truth, but also confidence that you're speaking the truth as you know it. So when I think about that book, I think of those kinds of issues. But there's certainly, you know, but we, anyway. So, so I think sometimes these issues are issues that um, are not so much even in the book. Well, they're in the book itself, but they're, you have to look for them to, to bring them to the surface. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, in, you know, in the last generation or so, um, the, in America, the numbers of people who are affiliated with a church mm -hmm. has, has gone down significantly, or who say they're affiliated with the church has gone down significantly. And so fewer and fewer young people are being raised going to Sunday school or getting other kinds of uh, moral education that in the past a, a lot of times had happened uh, through religious organizations. And I wonder if, if maybe, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but do you think that there's any change in what people are looking for children's books to do to fill that gap. They, they still want their children to get some kind of moral education, even if they don't bring them to Sunday school for that. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a very good question. 
a lot of the Sunday school moralizing was very simplistic and very black and white in you know, the sense of clear, clearly you're supposed to do this and you're not supposed to do that. So I think some of, it's, some of that I'm glad that it's gone from how we're educating our children. Because I, I, I like to introduce them to moral complexity. And, and a book like Shiloh, Shiloh is very morally complex, but Marty is framing a lot of his reflections in religious terms. That I can't believe that Jesus wouldn't care about a little injured dog. And if Jesus isn't that way, you know, there's something wrong with Jesus. I mean, I'm, I'm, that's not an actual line from the book. But you can, but he's, he's framing it in, in spiritual terms. And that's something we also see in um, Brown Girl Dreaming, because Jackie Woodson is raised as a Jehovah's Witness, where she has to go door to door proselytizing for her faith. And that's very awkward to do. But also, she gets to feel important as she has this good news to share. And so I think religion is being brought into some of our mainstream children's books in ways that can be positive and more sophisticated and thoughtful than we would have found in Sunday school literature in the past. Yeah. So in my um, children and young adult class right now, I guess one of the problems that I'm facing or challenges that I'm facing is really getting to know my character since they're maybe like so much younger than me or just back in that teen stage. And I guess I'm trying to really learn how to get into my character's head and develop their true personality. And I guess I'm, my question to you is what ty type of techniques do you use to really get to know your character? Well, I think like a lot of authors, in this way all my characters are based on me like some aspect of myself. And there's so many contradictory aspects of me, I can focus more on one. And so I do a lot of brainstorming from childhood memories, particularly things that really bothered me as a child and moments like that. But now I also find it really helpful to be around kids, just to be in a school and to watch how the kids interact and to watch how the teachers interact with the kids. That sort of puts me back in that zone where I can channel childlikeness better like, I love when I go into an assembly as an author, and the kids file in, and the teacher will say, no, you two are not sitting together. <laughs> and I get all excited, like, you know, why? Or the teacher will say, all right, everybody, look to your left and look to your right. Have you made a good choice about where to sit? And kids get up and move. And so, so the more I'm around kids, I feel like that, that can really help to, to sort of put myself in the, the way that they look at the world. One last question, because I know you, it's really a 50 minute hour. Any last questions? Uh, okay, one last one. What's your favorite character that you've ever written? Ooh. <laughs> I, I think I have these early books, it's a series of four books about a girl named Dinah. Dinah by Dinah, Dinah for President, Dinah in Love, and Dinah Forever. And Dinah's a narcissist. Like, she, she really thinks that things that happen to her matter more than things that happen to other people. There's this thing where she has to recite a poem at school, and she forgets it. And she compares it to her friend Suzanne, who had to play a piano piece in a recital and forgot it. And she has the thought, this is like what happened to Suzanne, but a thousand times worse. Because <laughs> that had happened to Suzanne, and this was happening to Dinah. And so, I sort of feel proud that I got inside the head of someone who, in a way, is a morally unattractive character, because she's a narcissist. And she reforms, but she reforms too much. Like, I'll never talk again. I'll never, you know, no. If, I, if people think I talk too much, I'll never talk again. And, you know, and to find, so she has to figure out, like, how much space are you allowed to take up in the world? How much is it OK to sort of be in love with yourself a little bit? And how much is that just um, morally wrong and irritating to other people. So I had a lot of fun, a lot of fun with Dinah. And in the final book, and this is my last thing I'll say, she's in seventh grade and she, she learns that the sun is going to, or eighth grade, I guess, or seventh, I guess, she learns the sun's going to burn out in another five billion years. And she's all depressed. Because like, what's going to happen to Dinah's legacy? You know, who will be around <laughs> to remember Dinah? And I think that's a really deep, you know, philosophical question about what gives life meaning. And, and so, and, she, and I don't really answer it, but she makes her peace with it by the end of the book. 
Well, thank you all for coming and for um, taking an interest in children's literature. And if you want Thanks. to talk with Claudia a little more or get a book signed, we will be crossing the hall over to room 217 right after this.